1995, there were 1,979 women in prison, and today there are 4,233. There hasn't been a massive crime wave. There has been some influence of a drug influence to offending, which has increased the population a bit. But the main thing is the response to women's offending, which has become very much harsher. Sentences have become a bit longer, and longer enough. Um, more women are going in on remand, even though they don't actually end up being given a custodial penalty in the main. They're still entry prison on remand. Many have been breached for not turning up to um, community orders. And we've just got this kind of explosion in the system, which is mirrored in other groups as well, but it seems to be particularly acute with women. Um, and it's particularly sad, I think. And I think one of the things that is inordinately frustrating is that everybody knows it. It's not like a, a revelation. Um, when New Labour published, published its strategy on women offenders back in 2001, it said um, the way that you solve women's offending is through education, through employment, through support to vulnerable families, through safer housing, through ridding us of domestic violence and sexual abuse. You know, they named the things that were lying behind the was the offending by women and girls. And yet, having said that, they cheerily went on and built more capacity for women to go into the prison system. And I, I do often feel that we're, at worst, punishing women for experiences they've had of being victims, because it's, it's very complicated. A lot, of, a lot of women in prison have been both types of offence, they've been both victims of crime and perpetrators of crime. It doesn't excuse the fact that they've gone on to hurt or harm somebody else because they've been a victim, but it kind of helps to understand it to an extent. And we know that over half of the women in custody have been victims of domestic violence. We know a third have been victims of sexual abuse. Um, we know that the levels of mental illness in the women's population are, are vastly higher than women in the general population, and it's really vastly higher but also very much higher than, than men, and men's mental health in prison is not great. So we know we've got a particularly vulnerable group, and it wasn't until six women died, one after another, in a very close succession at style of prison, that the government decided to commission Jean Goulston, Baroness Goulston, who was chair of the PLP for, for Labour, to conduct a review. So the Goulston Review, and the Goulston Review was unequivocal. It said we have to reduce women's imprisonment. There is no reason to lock up non-violent women um, and to separate them from their children because the vast majority of women who go into prison have got small dependent children. And we know that almost 18,000 children are affected by um, their mum's imprisonment in the course of just a single year. Um, and what we do know about the children, um, which I found disturbing, it, it's, it's a tiny little fact, but it's a very disturbing fact. Only 5% of those 18,000 end up staying in their own homes when their mum goes to jail. So they experience a massive amount of disruption. They get farmed out to family members or to friends. If they're school age, they often have to change schools. They have to try and make new friends. They have to cope with what it's like trying to explain where your mum is to other children and to teachers and so forth. Um, and to be frank, I think unless someone's committed an, an offence that's so violent or so dangerous, um, that, that there really is no option for prison, then one has to think much more creatively. Uh, and I keep, keep kind of going back to what Arthur Kirsten said, this great thing in active creation, which I keep hoping, you know, we, we must reach this about prison reform generally, but you certainly argue we should reach it with women. He said, there are two ways of escaping our automated thinking and feeling. One is to lapse into dreaming or dreamlike states, and the other is to go in the opposite direction, where a spontaneous flash of insight can show a familiar situation or event in an entirely new light and elicit a new response to it. And I feel we've got to do that. You know, we, we, we keep looking at the same thing. Um, there's a sort of hand-wringing element of prison reform, which I've never liked, really. And it's, uh, as I get older and more and more kind of impatient for proper social change, uh, I'm not that interested in going over the problems again and again. I'm much more interested in the solutions. And I suppose that's why I'm, I am genuinely fired up by what's going on at the moment in relation to women who offend. That's why it's great having Joy and Rebecca here, because there are solutions out there. There's one in Birmingham that I've seen a few times, and I think he's brilliant. And there are others in Halifax, you know, wherever you look, at King's Cross, different places, women's centres 
springing up. Some have already existed, but they're now working more with women, who, vulnerable women who got caught up in the justice system. Others that have been created with an injection of funding. Um, but it's all very tenuous. The funding is only guaranteed till next March. Um, but you know, we can't, with this group, say, show us another way. You know, and, and oh, surely we've just got to keep on doing the same old thing because we don't have to do the same old thing. And the results from women's centres are really compelling. And I think they're compelling, obviously, because um, for any of us, probably people in the in the room, not many would have been to prison either as a prisoner or a visitor. But you, you, many of us would have been to hospital, it's a good analogy. You know, you go into an institution and you rapidly become in, dependent on that institution. You stop thinking for yourself and you become institutionalised. And women particularly become very dependent. And you see women saying, first time I've had someone to talk to, first time I've had some support, first time I've had someone helping me get off drugs. You think, why are we using custody? incarceration to help vulnerable women. That's a crazy way of going about things. If that's genuinely the case, that's what need, that's what's needed to help women take responsibility for their own lives and their kids, get out of debt, get the mental health care they need, break the addictions to drink and drugs, then the last place you want to put them is somewhere where there is no responsibility to take, where there are no decisions to take, and whether you are a kind of just like an object. And I noticed one of the resolutions you were debating is about people voting. And you think, you know, in what century are we in now? Um, but in 2004, there was a court case um, when, when uh, in Europe, when it was made absolutely clear that, that prisoners should have the right to vote, sentenced prisoners should vote. And we've been arguing with us since then. We did the expert evidence for the case. The case was won by someone called John Hurst, prisoner. Um, and government had have vanished the doorstep right up to now and still don't have voting for sentenced prisoners. So I suppose that's an example of how we don't treat people in prison as if they were people. Um, and, and it seems to me even the very few that have committed very violent crimes, you have to look at, for those people, is how do you make prison work? Well, you make it work by reducing the institutional impact as best you can and enabling them to speak for themselves. But oh, I mean, I'm just here to set a scene really, but I, I couldn't do that without telling you one of the reasons why I've stuck with this particular issue so long. And that is because quite early on in, in taking over and working um, at Prison Form Trust, which was a long time ago, about 10 years ago, I went into Brockhill Prison in the Midlands, quite near here, near Redditch. And um, there's a woman there who was really very badly um, scarred. She, she lost sort of her hair, her face was very badly burnt, she didn't have any eyebrows. She just, she did look very, bad, she'd obviously been really seriously burned. Um, and she started to talk to me about her life and she said that her mother had killed herself. And she said, it's only, I'll do it. She said, the scarf here is stopping me, but I will do it. Um, and the story was that she'd been in a car park um, and she tried to kill herself by setting light to her, to her own body. Um, and the tree in the car park had caught fire. Um, and she was in that prison for criminal damage to the tree. It's true. And the staff backed us up and said, yes, that was the case. And it, it did make me cry. It still makes me feel very sad when I think about it now. It's just so unbelievable, actually, that we could do that to another human being. Now, I'm not suggesting that people are all guilt-free, um, all victims, all vulnerable, but it is fair to say, um, if you look at the population of women who end up in the system, that very many of them are, and very many of them are going to lose their homes, they're going to lose their jobs, they're going to lose any prospect of employment, of responsibility, because prison will strip that away from them. And so I think we just should be really focused on, this, is, this should be the most minimal of interventions, it should be the absolute last resort, because if we're serious about enabling women to take responsibility, stop offending, make a go of their lives, then we're going about it in a, in a completely bizarre way that does more harm than good. Um, and I think there is potential now, ironically, with the cuts, that's the time to be saying to the Treasury, say to Ministry of Justice, it's time to do things differently.